When the war began, a sharp intensification of the old campaign to impose Japanese order on loose native ways succeeded chiefly on the surface of urban life. With their rounder features and more relaxed movements, the islanders' very appearance belied the claim of some Japanese, when it suited them, usually in demands for more sacrifice, that Okinawans were as Japanese as they. The residents of the former kingdom differed from the mainlanders in a hundred cultural ways, from their gentle humour to their lack of concern for racial purity and imperial divinity. The yokels continued producing their beautiful textiles, which irritated Prime Minister Tojo. What do they have to do with the war effort? he snapped. The young and the elite, still struggling through the Japanese regulated schools and Japanese dominated institutions, in order to achieve their ambitions in everything from medicine to business, provided most of the exceptions. Some thought the island as a whole could advance only through the mother country that controlled the economy and the influence. To put it as clearly as possible, Okinawa's first newspaper had preached in devotion to total assimilation. Even our manner of sneezing should be the same as that of Japanese main islanders. Many educated, influential Okinawans joined the crusade to expunge their peculiar cultural diversity, the island's very identity. But although some of the brightest, like Masahide Ota, tried to prove their loyalty by becoming more Japanese than the Japanese, the great mass of farming families remained almost entirely in their old world of tiny fields and ancestral tombs. Perhaps the most salient contrast with the Japanese was in the attitude toward life and death. Okinawans revered their ancestors, but not as warriors. The landscape's most noticeable man-made feature was the great number of tombs, handsome dwelling places for eternal spirits on which most families spent as much money and effort as they could spare. One of the two most prominent designs was shaped like a little house, often built into a hill unsuited for cultivation. The gently beautiful other, probably imported from China, looked like a turtle's back, the turtle being a symbol of long life. The family tomb was the site for picnics and holidays. Bones were preserved in a wonderfully colourful ceramic urn and their spirits were venerated. But with no glorification of death, let alone hunger to serve or sacrifice for a nationalist cause. Like Tadashi Kojo, many Japanese men who wanted to give their lives for the emperor seemed less interested in a good life than in an honourable death, signifying superior moral commitment and the unconquerable Japanese fighting spirit. Even the minority of Okinawans, who tried hardest to copy the Japanese ethic, spoke of Okinawa as different, largely because the emperor cult and world mission were artificial interests. Stunning Japanese victories from 1931 to 1941 failed to convince most Okinawans that Japan was divine and destined to rule the world. Long sceptical of nationalist ambitions and military methods, they felt much goodwill toward the United States in particular. Many of the 60,000 Ryukyuans who emigrated by 1930 went to Argentina, the Japanese mainland and Brazil with Ota's father. But many others were in Hawaii and California, and the savings sent back from their chiefly labouring wages represented riches to their families. Pearl Harbour wasn't enough to entirely squash those good feelings, even in the normal school, where Ota's best friend had a passion for English. When Japan began losing the war, however, propaganda about Americans polluting lust and racism much intensified especially in the schools. Cartoons of ape-like Americans hung in classrooms and filled magazines. Endlessly warning that the enemy's deepest desire was to rule the world and to torture, rape, murder or enslave all Asians, articles and broadcasts urged, Annihilate your hateful foe. In light of the triumph of equally outrageous propaganda in better educated Europe in the 1930s and 1940s, it is not so surprising that the message often got through. The effects of the war emergency grew relatively slowly, until 1944, when Prime Minister Hideki Tojo called the battle for Leyte a Tenozan, for the 16th century battle in which a feudal leader staked his entire army and fate on a single victory. 
Okinawa's turn to become the site of decisive triumph came later the same year. Most of its small garrison had been manning shore batteries or servicing planes and ships for anti-submarine operations. Now, in March, Imperial General Headquarters activated the 32nd Army for its defence, but belatedly and with grudging supplies, for Okinawa was only one of many outlying islands that must not be lost. The first serious shipments of equipment arrived in April 1944, a year before Yamato's end. Their meagerness puzzled schoolchildren raised on tales of Japan's invincible might and troubled their parents. The first troops, chiefly airfield construction units, seemed a mere token force. That contributed to the ambivalence of most Okinawans. Many were proud to see their island transformed into a centre of Japanese activity, happy to play that crucial role for the Empire after their long relegation to the most menial ones. Others resented the black market and lowered living standards. However, since money could no longer be sent in by emigres abroad, as well as the inevitable rapes and the army's commandeering of so many of the slim civilian resources. Very few rapes were reported because Okinawan women, even if not caught up in the general patriotism, tended to be as intimidated by the mood of national crisis as by the soldiers themselves. Still others, or the same people at different moments, felt themselves colonials trampled by Japanese combat boots and secretly hoped the potentially catastrophic battle could continue to be fought in the patriotic imagination. Japanese officers were quartered in the homes of the rich and educated, and it was they and the schoolchildren, even those less elevated than Ota, who were most likely to link their fate to Japan's. Those families felt honoured to drink sake with their guests. Here was a chance to prove that Okinawa wasn't the backwater for which it had always been taken. After the war, many of the elite, if they survived, would prefer to forget how much they'd wanted Japan to win, how the teachers had exhorted their charges to compete for frugality by bringing to school the scantiest lunch, a rice ball with a pickled plum, how they feverishly praised Japanese ways. Anguished men and women would wonder how they could have abandoned Okinawa's culture for Japan's. But now nothing could have been farther from the yearning minds of Masahide Ota and his fellows. When the newly activated 32nd Army began arriving in mid-1944, it made its headquarters in Shuri's administrative centres, on the hill just above the normal school. Thrilled to be so near their Japanese heroes, the students had not the faintest doubt that the immensely impressive senior officers who came and went from there would easily deal with the enemy if he was foolish enough to attempt an invasion. What could have been more certain than the promise of those splendid men to smash the American devils to smithereens? Ordinary Okinawans were less exhilarated. Long defenceless against natural disasters and powerful foreigners, they had an old saying about smallpox, which had to be treated with courtesy and care if the wind brought the terror to the island, and with prayers that it would leave as soon as possible. Now those farmers and workers had no chance to resist the hostilities into which Japan was pushing them. The only escape was for their little homeland not to be invaded. But if the enemy did approach, whites craving to torture their families to death, he had to be defeated. There was no alternative, which is why the military build-up worried them. Soon after, a new commander named Masao Watanabe arrived in late March, a year before the battle's start. A story spread that the approach of an airplane caused him to interrupt a speech and dash, wincing, to a window. Relieved to recognise a friendly in the sky, he nevertheless told his audience that roars from above would no longer necessarily be Japanese. General Watanabe warned that the enemy would indeed surely land, in which case all Okinawans would share the army's fate. Be resolute and go down in Gyokusai, he urged, repeating an insistent new imperial slogan. Gyokusai, literally, a gem shattered into myriad pieces, meant dying an honourable death for the emperor. The mainland's cry for a hundred million Gyokusai might be translated as, Better we all die. Watanabe's indignation over his inadequate supplies, just so much junk on this rock pile, 
and his linking an enemy landing with death for civilians as well as the garrison were predictably contagious. But the gloomy general was replaced after four months. Saipan's fall in July 1944 compelled Imperial General Headquarters to see Okinawa not as a rear base, but a possible enemy target, where a top commander with a proper force was needed. That changed everything. In August, eight months before the battle's start, troop ships and freighters began crowding Naha Harbour, while formations of warplanes flew overhead. Wide-eyed Okinawans watched a parade of tanks, trucks and cannon crack their few asphalt streets. Our island was turning into the mightiest fortress in all the Pacific, a fact that filled us with pride and apprehension, a native novelist recorded. Many secretly prayed for deliverance from the horrible war, which, some of us felt, Japan was imposing on us. The 32nd Army was becoming Tokyo's hope for the new Tenozan. We will never permit a single enemy to step on the Emperor's soil, a Japanese colonel promised Okinawan conscripts. Whatever had happened in the Philippines and on some South Pacific islands, we will make Okinawa the last decisive battleground and destroy him. Defending Okinawa means defending the land of the Emperor. Know that you will accept your fate in order to obey the Emperor's will. But all that still sounded unreal in the lovely setting. Even during the early fighting in 1945, Ernie Pyle would crowd his dispatches with descriptions of glorious vistas radiating an aura of gentle beauty. It would all seem so quiet and peaceful when the celebrated war correspondent camped one night on a hill overlooking a small river and terraced bluffs. A young sailor on a battleship preparing to join the initial naval bombardment which alone would ravage the land with over 60,000 5 to 16 inch shells, would gaze at the target and feel, I don't know, real enchanted by it, like a really beautiful painting. A lieutenant on a smaller ship would write his parents about rich green hills, russet, jade hillsides above azure water, neath crimson and gold of setting sun. Oh, what a setting! the memory would soon haunt. The scene of an ambush, piles of empty cartridge cases, bloody battle dressings, putrid corpses, would prompt an American to reflect on the peaceful land's hideous scourging. As I looked at the flotsam of battle scattered along that little path, I was struck with the utter incongruity of it all. There the Okinawans had tilled their soil with ancient and crude farming methods, but the war had come, bringing with it the latest and most refined technology for killing. It seemed so insane, and I realised that the war was like some sort of disease afflicting man. There on Okinawa the disease was disrupting a place as pretty as a pastoral painting. Sensitive Japanese soldiers agreed. Many yearned to return to mainland civilization, but most were moved by the Okinawan dreamland and paradisi. I thought I'd never see anything so beautiful, said one with a sigh. The people welcomed us so warmly. Did they have the slightest idea of what would happen to them and their lovely homeland? After six wretched days on a troop ship from Kagoshima, another arrival saw red roofs. Okinawan tiling was among the world's most beautiful, amid dazzlingly vivid greens. A whole island shimmering like a gem in a dream world. Who thought then that the whole of this fairy island would be burnt down in the flame of an inferno and turned into a pile of blackened rocks, from Manchuria to Okinawa? Captain Kojo was troubled. Apart from his stints in service schools, he'd served in Manchuria ever since his commissioning as an officer, but now his division was pulling out. Had the four years of fervent training to smash the Russians been for nothing? Was the Pacific War going so badly that the jewel of the empire had to be exposed to the Soviet predators? Kojo didn't know that the fall of Saipan, breaching an absolute national defence zone established less than a year earlier, had prompted Imperial General Headquarters to hurriedly shift forces, especially to Formosa. Still, he was disturbed by the order to withdraw. The 15,000-man 24th Division would be the largest and best-equipped component of the Japanese force on Okinawa, but it travelled there light. 
many transport and service personnel had to be left behind. Kojo's 22nd Regiment, less the battalion that had been shipped to the Carolines and some 800 men sent to China, boarded trains in July 1944, just as Dick Whitaker was entering boot camp and frail General Watanabe was spending his last days in command of the new 32nd Army on Okinawa. It was a thousand miles overland to Pusan in southern Korea, then only 200, most in relatively safe coastal waters, to the Kyushu port of Hakata, 80 miles north of Kagoshima, which was home for Kojo. But although he'd seen his family only three times since graduating, he didn't call them now. Troop movements were top secret. His younger brother hadn't told him he was headed for Saipan before he died there. Hakata rumours about the Empire's various fronts were discouraging. When Kojo's men learned their destination, most were relieved that it wasn't a South Pacific island or the presumably doomed Philippines. Okinawa was Japan, however non-Japanese culturally. Still, many assumed they'd spend their last days in that outland. Non-coms distributed envelopes to each man for nail clippings and a lock of hair, the traditional mementos sent to families of the dead. Kojo ignored his. Although it would honour him and his family to be among the great number certain to perish on Okinawa, he believed he would see them again. When his subordinate officers asked about their chances on Okinawa, his carefree I don't know and don't care was intended to boost their morale with a display of the supreme confidence required of Japanese command. But it was also the truth. His men were less poised. Not that they doubted their eventual victory, if necessary, ensured by a miracle, such as those that had saved 13th century Japan from the militarily far superior Mongols. Two invading fleets were destroyed, the second of which may have been the world's largest naval force until then, five times larger than the Spanish Armada three centuries later. The agent was sudden typhoons, soon recognised as divine wind or kamikaze, Japanese priests and flocks took them as proof that theirs was indeed a sacred nation, inviolable and unconquerable, a belief that would sustain the fervent people through many hardships foreigners considered impossible and pointless. Thus the troops awaiting transport to Okinawa were convinced that heavenly favour would again see the country through any and all grave crises awaiting her. That didn't make their own lives sacred, however. Scratchy Records broadcast the vaunting Sinking Song, a current hit. Instant sinking, instant sinking. That's the triumphant shout. But everyone suspected the droves of ships going down were no longer the enemies. The hit parade waters of American submarines now included the Ryukyu stepping stones that led straight to the homeland. Locals whispered about bodies washing up on nearby shores and about fishermen reluctant to put to sea because the cursed submarines prowled even Kagoshima Bay. A stunning 2,000 Japanese bottoms had already been sent down, most by American submarines, which were tearing the network of imperial sea routes to ribbons. During the present year of 1944, no more than 5% of the production of conquered Asian oil fields reached Japan. After the Okinawan fighting would begin eight months later, not a single ship would arrive with supplies or reinforcements. But that too failed to dent Japanese combat resolve, despite all the talk among American non-combatants at home about why it should have. Transport to Okinawa. Although even Yamato was occasionally pressed into service as a troop ship, most forces headed for Okinawa travelled in a grab bag of inferior vessels. The 450-mile journey dragged on for four scorching days, passengers retching with Nausea and foreboding Oltho one or more of. The Ryukyus was always in sight. The worst rumour about previous convoys was true. Six weeks earlier, a furiously overcrowded converted merchantman named Toyama Maru had sailed from Kojo's native Kagoshima with the entire 44th Independent Mixed Brigade. It had nothing in common with a pleasure cruise. Near the war's happier beginning, a poet had written of hellish suffocation alongside explosives in the inferno-like heat of his ship's dungeon-like hold. 
Now an Okinawa-bound soldier claimed greater agony on his short voyage. We were worse than caged animals, we were like criminals, ready to be tortured. He noticed yellowish streaks in a lead ship's wake. Toyama Maru's wake was a deeper yellow, for she was transporting 6,000 men, and one of her two engines was out of commission. Japanese soldiers were heroes of endurance, but the summer heat that stewed their vomit in the oven-like compartments was as bad as anything this obedient group remembered. The ship used to serve the China trade. Squashed in three levels of what they called silkworm shelves, the eleven soldiers in each six-by-twelve-foot area had no room to sit up and so little air that they feared suffocation. June sea winds blew some of the birdcage waste back on deck, where they had to step in it, then carry their soiled shoes into their berths to prevent theft. It was a life for beasts, one private observed, to himself of course, such subversive thoughts were never breathed aloud. A former health service clerk named Yoshizumi Waku went up on deck from the stinking inferno below, but couldn't stomach breakfast even in the fresh air. Months earlier, Waku had felt safe from further fighting because he'd already served three turns in Manchuria and China. Then a draft call reached deep among grandfathers, feeble specimens and other deferred categories, and there he was, hearing the dreaded, frenzied shout from the port side. Torpedoes! USS Sturgeon, a battle-tested American submarine, had fired four. Most Japanese troops were below during the moment of stupefying flash, thunder and terror when all hit, tearing vast holes in the ship's sides. Thousands of drums of gasoline in the cargo turned the holds into crematoria. Most who survived the explosions drowned when the hulk went under almost immediately. Fighting to stay afloat and free of the flames in the water, 27-year-old Shigeo Yamaguchi, formerly an agricultural consultant, also fought the thought that he was about to join the seaweed forever. On the morning Yamaguchi had left his tiny home to answer his draft call, his four-year-old son grabbed him by the neck, shrieking, Don't go, Papa, don't go! He regretted not having held the boy tight for a second, an urge he suppressed in order to keep visiting friends from seeing him commit such an unpatriotic act. To have comforted his child would have betrayed a spiritual weakness much disapproved of in the national dedication to wartime sacrifices. Yamaguchi and Waku would be among the 10% of survivors. Some 5,600 men, over a quarter as many as those soon to die on hellish Iwo Jima, and almost twice as many as those who would go down with Yamato, were already dead. They wouldn't figure in Okinawa's grand tally, since the battle was still nine months away. The 22nd Regiment's turn for the Okinawa run came in mid-August 1944. The convoy hugged shallow water and zigzagged its short runs in the open. The ships delivered their 2,800 troops' groggy butt intact. Captain Kojo's unexpected pleasure at his first sight of Okinawa was heightened by the contrast with stark Manchuria. Even in a Naha harbour clogged with transport ships, he saw exotic fish darting through translucent water. Vivid coral fringed a tranquil island beckoning with many hues of green. Ashore, he was further taken by stands of pine trees bordering roads and the luxurious vegetation. Even Naha's red light district, when he was invited for dinner there, seemed another example of Okinawa's beautiful culture. Although the poverty was much deeper than even his poor Satsumas, Okinawans were easier going and more hospitable than any people he'd seen. All were so gracious in their rustic way, smiling and bowing to the Yamato soldiers, that even his gruffer men were touched. The 32nd Army ordered the soldiers to build their own barracks of bamboo and not to fraternise. Some disobeyed. Only battalion commanders and above could mix with civilians and choose their own quarters. Smartly uniformed Kojo rented a room in the house of a prosperous farmer with a 16-year-old daughter. The captain noticed that Okinawan girls were far less straight-laced than Japanese, perhaps because the subtropical heat matured them early. Beautiful, charming Yasu knocked on the handsome visitor's door at night, and he liked her very much. 
but he succumbed only twice, otherwise reminding himself that pleasure impaired the concentration of an Imperial Army officer preparing for combat. The farmer's house bordered Kadena Airfield, south of Okinawa's neck, the work site to which Masahide Ota and other normal schoolboys had been walking to and from for their weekly stints as labourers. Kojo's 1st Battalion had been assigned to defend the two miles between its dirt runways and the open beach, where almost nothing had been prepared for the American landing expected precisely there. No anti-tank or anti-personnel mines were available, not even barbed wire. And Kojo sorely missed the regiment's horses, all but four of which had been left in Manchuria. As a battalion commander, he had one of those four, but the regiment lacked even carts for transportation, which meant the men would have to be worked harder than ever. Okinawa was alive with feverish digging. Kojo's battalion joined to gouge out bunkers in rises that dominated the beach near the airfield. He kept the pace furious during round-the-clock shifts. An ordnance shop fashioned picks and shovels from wagon rails previously used for transporting sugarcane to refineries, those without tools used their hands and tried to maintain their energy on a diet of chiefly rice and miso soup with sweet potato greens. Not quite enough of anything. Two months later, American planes and surface ships would join submarines in totally severing Japan's sea route to Okinawa. Even in that late summer of 1944, the soldiers received almost no mail, Ships that managed to arrive until October were too packed with essential supplies to bother with letters. When American troops eventually landed, their mail would be delivered almost as regularly as ammunition and water. Units would sometimes receive their tremendous, terrific boost to morale when they were only a few hundred yards back from the line. Letters sustained many American fighters who might otherwise have found it impossible to continue. Those from Dick Whitaker's mother, who wrote every single day he was away, would come in bunches of three to half a dozen, from Sorgates, 10,000 miles away. But Japanese soldiers were virtually isolated in one of their own prefectures, 350 miles from the mainland. Many would get no more than one or two letters during the interminable ten months of digging. Officers fared better. During breaks from inspecting his fortifications, Kojo sometimes retired to a patch of shade to read a letter from his wife for the nth time. He had married her ten weeks before he left Manchuria, the culmination of what had begun with little interest for the 24-year-old captain who knew no women, let alone marriageable women, apart from occasional tea-house courtesans and prostitutes. That was not unusual for academy officers, with their disdain for civilian life. Most eventually settled into an arranged marriage. That was the intention of Kojo's elder brother, who worked in publishing. Disliking the thought of Tadashi never having a family, the Tokyo-based brother sent him a photograph of the daughter of a prominent engineer high in the Ministry of Communications. Despite the captain's certainty, he'd never take time from his military duties for domestic life. He was enchanted and even more so by the delicacy and refinement of the young woman's letters. Apart from some embarrassment over his own unpractised writing style, their ease with each other in their correspondence charmed Kojo still further. He arrived in Tokyo for his wedding in April 1944, dashing in his cape, proud of his position in the unconquerable elite of regular army officers, but unable to sustain his pose of nonchalance when he caught sight of young Emiko. Even more attractive than her photograph, she was also, with her modern, citified face and traditional kimono and coiffure, a rare blend of contemporary chic and old Japanese virtues. Her large eyes expressed both subtlety and wholly unexpected femininity. He thanked his luck when she raised them to his. Although Tokyo's saturation bombing was a year away, the city had much changed since his last trip there, when he was a candidate for a course for spotter officers just a year earlier. All lights were blacked out, few non-basic foods were available, and Kojo couldn't find a tailor to make a new uniform for the marriage. None of that grazed his certainty of Japan's victory, about which he actually forgot for moments. 
In the days before the marriage, Emiko's mother suggested the betrothed take walks in the wealthy family's elegant suburb. Although much more articulate than most regular officers, Kojo spoke with the reserve and in the dialect of his Satsuma, where real men used few words, while Emiko's voice shimmered with the sophistication of generations of Tokyo residents. On the couple's trip to Nishitawan, the bride's beauty and cultivation showed in everything from her kimonos to her smiles. Kojo's delight and sharing of intimacy were new even to his imagination. The five days on the train and few weeks in a house just outside his desolate camp were by far the happiest of his life. Now Emiko's loving letters confided she missed him powerfully. She promised a visit, hinting her influential father could arrange it. Kojo smiled at her naivete, returned the letters to his pocket, and reassumed his academy-bred rigidity. Vast amounts of work lay ahead before he could mangle the American landing. Much of the digging was completed by mid-December. Pride enlivened the exhausted soldiers' songs, which echoed from the hills in the evening. Kojo, still a quick-tempered stickler, was relatively pleased with his nearly finished fortifications, further protected by coral growth overhead. After five grinding months, he shifted his men to more training. The immense power of American pre-invasion bombardments on previous islands had shown the terrible cost of exposure on or near the beach. This time the defenders would stay safely burrowed until the enemy bombardment stopped for its landing operations. The 24th Division's artillery would also remain in protected emplacements, opening fire only when the landing craft approached. The artillery and anti-tank guns had been intended for destroying the mechanised, heavily armed Soviets. Its concentrated firepower on top of the regiment's own guns would maul the enemy and prevent him from digging in on the beach. As at Iwo Jima, it would tear the Americans to bits, at which point the poised infantry would appear from the safety of the refuges now being constructed for a massive counter-attack. Kojo relentlessly practised his battalion's thrusts and feints for that great slaughter. He knew his old-fashioned bolt-action rifles were no match for the enemy's great firepower. But Americans were amateurs. Japanese professionalism, training and spiritual strength would win the day, as they had so often in China, where furious bayonet charges had often panicked the enemy. His own troops excelled in the hand-to-hand -hand death struggle that would nullify American advantages in metal and material. Grateful for the luck that had placed him there to shatter them, Kojo relished his first chance for real combat. Operational plans and accident. Operational plans were reviewed at regimental headquarters on a hill overlooking Kadena Airfield. At one meeting, the regimental ordnance officer demonstrated a charge with a delayed action fuse that would demolish enemy tanks when men sneak it up and shove it beneath their bellies. The ordnance officer opened a wooden box that housed the makeshift new weapon and disappeared except for the portion of his legs inside of his boots. The accidental explosion also wounded the higher officers sitting in the first row. All were rushed to a hospital except for Kojo, who refused treatment, telling himself it was his solemn duty to remain composed in the face of all possible shocks. Personal pride and a desire to be worthy of his ancestry combined with his intense training to reveal no weakness. He rode back to his battalion and held out for nearly a month. His headaches were unbearable, his fever was extreme, and pus from his ear stuck his head to his pillow. When he was finally taken to a hospital, his doctors hoped it wasn't too late to save his life. On October 9, 1944, command officers of the 32nd Army, the overwhelmingly Japanese leaders of the prefectural government and the cream of Okinawan society, indulged themselves in a military ball. The imposing affair in the best Naha Hotel lasted until early morning, but its high point had come earlier, when General Isamu Cho, the 32nd Army's blustery chief of staff, promised complete destruction of the enemy if he dared attack. When the pledge was tested hours later, Japanese troops and Okinawan civilians unknowingly glimpsed the future. I hope to God we won't have to go on any more of those screwy islands, one of the 19,000 marines to be wounded on Iwo Jima would venture. He'd be among the lucky ones, 
nearly 7,000 Americans and 21,000 Japanese would die there, in one sense unnecessarily, for although B-29s would use Iwo's eight square miles for emergency landings after bombing Japan, it would never become the major base planned by American strategists. That dose of war's boundless bad luck wasn't shared by civilians, because none inhabited the garrison island. But Okinawa would surely never be operationally unnecessary. Just 350 miles from mainland Japan and 500 from China, the piece of offshore rope, as the name meant, was well positioned to cut off Japan from her occupied territories on the Asian continent, while serving as an unsinkable aircraft carrier for attacks on the home islands. It would also be a fine staging area for the American invasion of those islands, planned for late 1945. Large enough for assembling the necessary armies, Okinawa offered excellent anchorages in sheltered bays within easy striking distance of the mainland, and enough flat land for air bases within comfortable range of the targets. No one suspected that the first B-29 raid on the mainland would take off from the island on the war's very last evening because a new kind of bomb would obviate the need for more raids. For ten times as many people as on screwy Iwo Jima, Okinawa would be another unlucky draw, especially since a different aircraft carrier might have been chosen. Admiral Ernest King, Chief of Naval Operations, preferred Formosa, 380 miles southwest of Okinawa, as a base for simultaneously linking up with the weakening Chinese allies. Okinawa was doomed only six days before the Grand Ball in the Naha Hotel, when senior Pacific admirals decided to take one or more of the Ryukyu Islands instead. Although Japanese strategists still guessed the enemy's choice would be Formosa, they continued reinforcing Okinawa too, where Tadashi Kojo's battalion was digging its bunkers above the beach near Kadena Airfield. Task Force 58, as it would be designated, struck Okinawa just a week after the Admiral's decision, while attendants were still cleaning up after the ball the previous evening and night. The 5th Fleet's awesome fast carrier force, which would dispose of Yamato seven months later, comprised no fewer than ten carriers, six fast battleships, eight escort carriers, five light cruisers, and, on an average day, over sixty destroyers. It launched its heaviest single-day raid on October 10, 1944. Nearly 1,400 strikes dropped 600 tonnes of bombs and fired thousands of rockets on that opening shot against Okinawa. On recently opened Yomitan Airfield, two miles north of the Kadena Field, Japanese maintenance and service crews had just helped dispatch planes to Formosa and were breakfasting on the flight line. Although a high degree of air raid readiness had been in force for a week, enemy planes were so unexpected, rather as at Pearl Harbour, that the men assumed their own were returning for some reason. Anti-aircraft guns fired belatedly at the vapour trails of the attacking craft, all much too fast for them. Five Japanese fighters managed to take off. None returned. Among the debris on the ground, of warehouses, an engine plant and field headquarters, a headless corpse bubbled blood. Four more waves crippled additional airfields with fresh bombs and rockets from their carriers, then with strafing runs. Thousands of rounds of artillery shells were destroyed, as well as five million machine gun and rifle rounds, and a month's supply of food for the entire 32nd Army. 88 Japanese aircraft, a serious threat to a landing fleet, were demolished, three quarters of them on the ground. The raid was so successful and the photographic intelligence so useful for the invasion's preliminary planning that two months would pass before it was repeated, in January, with even greater duration and force. Japanese failures contributed significantly. The main radar malfunctioned, the first American wave began its descent before it was recognised, anti-aircraft performance was dismal, and interceptors were shot down almost immediately after taking off. The enemy plane's nimble movements eluded our old-fashioned three-step shooting method and we couldn't sight at all, lamented an anti-aircraft gunner. But the real blow was the poor quality of our detection equipment, which kept us from knowing about the approach of such a huge enemy force until the very last moment. Still, 
We all still firmly believed our air power would retaliate for the enemy's treacherous attack. Our only hope hung on new planes arriving quickly before the enemy task force could sail away. That first encounter with Americans was also the first combat experience for many Japanese. It shocked large numbers of them, and civilians even more. Despite the emergency's air raid drills, training with bamboo spears and the digging of shelters under Japanese direction, Naha remained a late-rising city. When the first wave of grumans and courtesies awakened residents that October 10th, it was the sound of their engines that warned them. No siren sounded before the first bombs landed and explosions began literally shaking the city. Ammunition stacked amid supplies in the port blew up, extending the damage of the incendiary bombs. An October wind spread the conflagration through houses of paper and wood. Some of the feverish firefighting volunteers took refuge and prayed. Many were singed by racing flames on roads clogged with people trying to flee the city, by far Okinawa's largest, with a population of 65,000. At least 80% was destroyed. Roughly a thousand civilians, twice as many as military personnel, were killed. The old capital of Shuri on high ground above Naha took few hits. The hill complex containing the headquarters of the Japanese 32nd Army, as well as several divisional and artillery command headquarters, was completely undamaged. So was the normal school, where the patriotic resolution and anti-Americanism of Masahide Ota and his classmates was further strengthened by the enemy's dastardly blow. But Naha lay in shock. When the attacks finally ceased in the evening, residents left the shelter of trenches, caves and family tombs, some to climb surrounding hills. One described the entire city as reduced to glowing embers. The setting sun blazed behind the writhing remains of the city, producing an illusion that the sun itself had set Naha on fire. Ten days later, a Japanese medical corpsman disembarked from the living hell of a ship's hold. His voyage had taken a month because his wretched ship arrived as Naha blazed on October 10th and turned back to Kagoshima. Screams from torpedoed sister ships worsened the nightmare of the second trip still more, but the corpsman's joy at returning to terra firma lasted only until he saw that Naha was still smouldering. Many evacuees returned to Naha when the ruins cooled, some to rebuild what they could of their houses or erect crude shacks for replacement. Classes resumed in the open, the children again singing, Thank you, dear soldiers. A kind of military harem went up in the burned-down red-light district, some of the ladies impressed into service by the army and paid almost nothing. But much of Naha, including schools, hospitals and libraries, as well as factories, warehouses and offices, could not be rebuilt. Six months before most American civilians had heard the name Okinawa, October 10th, or simply 1010, entered the Okinawan vocabulary as shorthand for tragedy. Evacuations from the island, eventually to total some 160,000 people, had begun before 1010. Mainland Japanese, some 5% of the population, were first to hurry home. Many officials of the prefectural government that had been girding the natives for war were gone before it arrived. Parents hesitated when, on July 19th, the prefectural government ordered native young and aged to join the evacuees. Send our precious children away. To Japan, with its anti-Okinawan prejudice. But school teachers were among the quickest to complete. Senior teacher Seitoku Shinzato was, typically, both more Japanese said and more concerned with upholding authority than most Okinawans. 37 year old Shinzato knew children would hinder military operations if the enemy really did invade. And if, as some Okinawans whispered, the child bayoneting American beasts slaughtered everyone on the island, Okinawan blood had to survive somewhere, since nothing was more important than perpetuating the family line. Besides, food was already scarce. Apart from the government order, therefore, which had to be obeyed, Shinzato felt it was right to take his mother, wife and three young children to the designated pier. His wife, also a schoolteacher, 
would be responsible for 40 children during their evacuation in Kyushu. Three ships bearing some 6,000 evacuees departed from Naha on August 21, almost two months after the sinking of the Toyama Maru, with the loss of nearly the entire 44th Independent Mixed Brigade. Alone with his ambivalent feelings, Shinzato felt his distress increase with each additional day without word from his family. After all, there was no guarantee they'd reach Kyushu safely, and what would happen to them there even if they did? Like the majority of the elite who strongly identified with Japan as the mother country, the schoolteacher nevertheless thought of her as alien. The family had left on the Tsushima Maru, a freighter that had sailed from Shanghai with a cargo of silkworm cocoons for the home islands and stopped in Naha to pick up the evacuees, as well as to discharge soldiers transferred from China. The dockside partings were full of tears. Papa, Papa, will we ever be able to see each other again? Two weeks later, rumours circulated that one of the three crammed ships that had sailed together from Naha failed to reach Kagoshima. Full of foreboding now, Shinzato travelled north to his native city of Nago to ask his terrible question of a police captain who might know the truth because he worked with the 32nd Army and might reveal it because he was a former pupil. No, nothing unusual had happened, the policeman stated, but his grimace betrayed him. Shinzato bit his lip until he was alone, then sagged with grief and anger. He tried to comfort himself with the thought that his wife and mother were brave women who would have managed to die together without becoming frantic. But he couldn't comprehend why he was alive and the children he'd sent away to save were dead. The unmarked freighter had been torpedoed at 2am by USS Bofin near Aku Ishijima, Badstone Island, roughly midway between Naha and Kagoshima. Shinzato's children were asleep, together with their mother, grandmother, and seven members of Shinzato's brother's family. 1,484 women and children were killed, almost as many as in some of the American divisions that were about to fight the costliest battle in their history on Okinawa. The 177 survivors were warned not to talk about the sinking and to send postcards back to Okinawa saying all was well. The man who replaced Masao Watanabe as commander of the 32nd Army was one of Japan's most respected and liked general officers. After generations of inferior prefectural governors sent from Tokyo, Okinawans were relieved and flattered by the choice. It did not occur to them that strengthening the losing side in war only prolongs the struggle, causing more pain to both sides. They had no way of knowing that they themselves, the civilians, would bear the heaviest price for the 32nd Army's great improvement under General Mitsuru Ushijima, its excellent new commander. The universal admiration for Ushijima was reinforced by his evocation of Takamori Saigo, a soldier, statesman and poet who had greatly contributed to Japan's modernization following her opening to the world. Saigo the Great went on to disembowel himself in a sea of his followers' blood after a catastrophic rebellion, precipitated by dissent to the 1876 invasion of Korea. But the whole political spectrum, from extreme militarists to liberal democrats, cherished the peculiarly Japanese combination of qualities that earned him his reputation as the last true samurai. The frugal man, almost alone among his contemporaries to care nothing for medals and honours, became the Meiji Restoration's only truly popular hero, not least for his death in defence of the national honour and faith against corrupting Western ways. A Japanese who somehow didn't know Saigo's origins might easily have guessed. Such a statement and so few words were the Satsuma ideal. Dedicated samurai families like Saigo's poor one raised their boys to cherish simplicity and modesty as well as bravery and service. Young Tadashi Kojo's uncles often recounted episodes of sacrifice from the life of Saigo of Satsuma, as he was also known. You must be a real man, they told him, like Saigo. Ushijima now gave Kojo a living model of a true Satsuma samurai, and a special one, for he and his commanding officer were almost neighbours, from the same Kagoshima stock and caste. The general's association with Saigo was so strong that many thought he resembled the legendary hero physically. 
tall for a Japanese and emanating a commanding presence, Ushijima was so much the picture of a winning leader that his appearance alone inspired his troops. They revered him, and his officers did even more. The distinguished man seemed more an elder brother than a field officer, no common thing in an army with piercing attention to rank and its trappings. Ushijima once served as the military training officer at his alma mater, Kagoshima's first middle school. He'd requested that post, which would have shamed many majors, because he liked teaching and cared little for furthering his career. Even after distinguishing himself with infantry units in the field, when he'd become known for his victories and bravery, he retained his easy-going modesty. Some liked him also because he didn't enjoy making speeches and kept them short. Like Saigo, he seemed incapable of promoting his self-interest in the often fierce competition for advancement. When chosen for the staff of the Minister of War in 1932, he at first declined the coveted appointment, explaining that he didn't feel up to the job, having served only in out-of-the-way places. Japanese commanders were valued more as symbolic embodiments of strength than as hands-on strategists or policymakers. One of their primary functions was to radiate some of their emperor's sublimity and benevolence, together with a resolve so strong that nothing on earth could shake it. Ushijima's field officers perceived the charismatic general as a kind of Mount Fuji, an immovable, unflappable guarantor of their victory, who, properly, stood above daily decisions, leaving all but the broadest strokes to his staff. In Kagoshima, where other strong but silent generals had grown up within a stone's throw of him, it was almost a motto that real men didn't bother with details. Even in high staff jobs, such as senior deputy to the Ministry of the Army, Ushijima seemed little interested in the give and take of intensely debated matters. Yet superiors were struck by his section's marked improvement, achieved largely because his subordinates admired his inability to quibble or nag. His reputation having grown still more during his command of an infantry division in Manchuria, he was honoured in 1942 by appointment to command the Imperial Academy, of which he was of course a graduate, as it strained to produce for a war racing to its zenith. Four years earlier, a fire in the cadet barracks had resulted in severe demotions. When another blaze destroyed some administrative offices, officers now braced for more wrath. Hideki Tojo, reviled by Americans as Prime Minister and Minister of the Army, ordered severe punishment, including dispatch of the offenders in charge to the front, if appropriate. But Ushijima thanked the officers for their work containing the fire, argued that the full responsibility was his as commandant, and said he'd never send an officer to fight as punishment. He held firm against Tojo's fury and prevailed, adding to the fervent loyalty of his staff. The current Minister of War was among many high officers eager to be appointed commander of the 32nd Army. Few grumbled when the prize went to Ushijima. Most Okinawans were as cheered as the garrison itself by the arrival of magnificent Ushijima in August 1944. Those who caught sight of him saw an effortlessly friendly hero who, amazing for a Japanese bigwig, stopped to thank startled student volunteers who were helping dig fortifications. Field officers like Captain Kojo found him the commander under whom they dreamed of serving. His personal qualities were much more than a secondary matter. Subordinates were convinced that the Japanese fighting spirit with which he infused the 32nd Army counted for more than its armament. When civilians encountered Ushijima's chief of staff, by contrast, they often saw a fierce countenance excoriating a quivering subordinate. It was fiery Isamu Cho who, the evening before the devastating October 10th air raid, had boasted the enemy would meet complete destruction if he dared attack Okinawa. Cho's reputation as a firebrand and intimidator was as deserved as Ushijima's as a father figure. The notebook of 51-year-old Cho, also a lieutenant general, was universally dreaded. His brushed record of his orders there included each project's completion date. Officers who failed to meet their deadline had the pages shoved in their faces as he roasted them. His temperamental likeness to Ushijima ended with his own reputation for extreme bravery. 
Many who saw nothing of the commander except a confident smile from an imposing presence endured outburst after thunderous outburst from his burly chief of staff. You fool, can't you do anything? The fools included bright young officers whom Imperial General Headquarters had selected from its own complement to staff the 32nd Army. The best came to feel that Cho's bark was worse than his bite. Their explosive mentor was simply unable to speak softly, especially now, when driven by fierce desire to complete his tasks before the possible invasion. Personally, Cho was outgoing and likeable. More to the point, his charisma and rhetoric served to boost the 32nd Army's morale. Besides, if he demanded the dotting of every I in reports to him, that was his job as Chief of Staff, just as Commanding Officer Ushijima was supposed to hold himself above such details. Still, the contrast between the two Lieutenant Generals went far deeper than billet or personality. In the best traditions of military officers everywhere, laconic, mild-mannered Ushijima was totally apolitical. In the worst tradition of Japanese militarism, eloquent Cho was immersed in the strident jingoism, without which the Battle of Okinawa would never have taken place. Cho's background is related to archival evidence that disproves some conventional wisdom about Emperor Hirohito. The Emperor did not hold no greater personal ambition than to pursue his love of marine biology. He wasn't an essentially peace-loving hostage to a clique of militarists who dragged Japan into the Second World War, despite his instincts and wishes. On the contrary, Hirohito took an active role in sanctioning Japan's conquests in the 1930s, secretly encouraging and supporting his seeming insubordinates. Still, the initial strikes upon Manchuria and China were remarkable for being planned and executed by a hot-headed faction of field officers who acted with wide latitude. Radical majors and colonels fabricated pretexts, mounted attacks, and presented Tokyo with fates. Accomplice the civilian authorities were unable to reverse, partly because they felt intimidated by the army's fervent expansionist cliques, partly because the battlefield triumphs, glorified by the press, won wild cheers from most of the public. Those middle-level field officers counted on moderates being too weak to restrain the never-officially authorised expansionist operations. With the blessings of some important politicians and generals in addition to the emperor, it was they who thrust Japan into her greedy war by compelling support of their unprovoked aggression. Cho was among the most passionate of them. The lover of strong drink and pretty women joined the notorious Cherry Blossom Society, Sakurakai, at its founding in 1930. The evanescent Cherry Blossom's disappearance after its brief life was an ancient symbol of the samurai's readiness to die for his sovereign at a moment's notice. And together with self-sacrifice, the Sakurakai pledged to cleanse Japan of liberal democrats and other decadent Western influences that were polluting her traditional virtues. Their salvation was military dictatorship. Isamu Cho stood out even among the ultranationalists who were utterly convinced that uniquely virtuous Japan had been grievously wronged by hypocritical evildoers, and that right would be done only when the army, sole repository of the national honour, wielded its sword to eliminate foreign enemies and domestic weaklings. The florid captain, prime mover of the society's most militant faction, was one of eleven members who prepared a coup d'etat in January 1931. Their plan to murder the prime minister and install a general as dictator was abandoned at the last moment, but they did carry out the celebrated Manchurian incident nine months later. Field-grade officers blew up a section of the Japanese-owned South Manchurian Railway, claimed that Chinese had done the insulting damage and punished them by invading. The carefully prepared Kwantung Army, named for Canton Province, then tramped through the whole of Manchuria within months. Most of Japan's great business and financial trusts, Zaibatsu, initially opposed the adventure. So did much of the court aristocracy surrounding the emperor and the elected government the army supposedly served, all succumbed. But fearing that weak-kneed diplomacy would sacrifice the army's glorious gains, Cho and a second ringleader led another attempt to replace the government with a military dictator, 
who was to appoint Cho himself to the crucial post of chief of Tokyo's Metropolitan Police. That plan called for the assassination of the Prime Minister. A conspirator later testified that Cho insisted on threatening the Emperor with a drawn dagger if he were reluctant to sanction the new cabinet. Higher officers thwarted that plot, perhaps because such incredibly blasphemous talk exceeded the bounds of even the super patriots. But although Cho was arrested, civilian judicial authorities were powerless to punish him amid the patriotic euphoria induced by the army's easy devouring of Manchuria. For his episodes of blatant high treason, the stormiest of petrels was merely given a pro forma lecture by the Inspector General of Military Education, who had been slated to be the conspirator's prime minister and transferred to a pleasant post in the Kwantung army evidence of how thoroughly the most violent, disloyal patriots had already intimidated the army and government. It had become dangerous to question even the most extreme acts proclaimed to have been taken out of pure motives for the nation's glory. From Manchuria, Cho helped pressure the army high command to support making it the puppet state of Manchukuo by circulating a rumour that the Kwantung army might otherwise declare its independence. Again in 1938, he, now a regimental commander, was a ringleader in sitting more direct action, this time an attack on a Russian position on the Manchukuo-Soviet border. That would have drawn the army into another border skirmish, but to the fury of many general staff officers, the emperor refused to sanction a major new conflict. Ardent Cho persisted. During another desperate battle with Soviet border troops, he and a fellow officer urged their men to make suicide attacks against the enemy's tanks. Cho himself was said to have demonstrated Japanese coolness under fire by pulling down his breeches and standing exposed on a parapet. As chief of staff of the Japanese army that later overran Thailand, he took it upon himself to press Vichy France to cede strategic territory, which Japanese troops quickly occupied. In all those actions, he exhibited contempt for anything not useful to Japan, an attitude that underlay the army's often appalling treatment of non-Japanese soldiers and civilians. As a leading staff officer at Nanking in 1937, he faked a secret order, changing let them go to finish them off for disposing of thousands of Chinese prisoners. The subsequent brutalization of the Chinese capital was perhaps the world's greatest single act of willful cruelty until then. Six weeks of maiming, raping and murdering during which up to 75,000 Chinese were shot, slashed and burned to death, including many thousands of adult, aged and infant civilians. Cho and the scrupulously neat Ushijima differed sharply even in dress. The chief of staff was wont to put his feet on his desk, unbutton his tunic and enjoy a smoke. He would also remain fond of good drink and attractive women throughout the fighting. But no difference in personality or temperament, not even their opposite positions in political involvement, would come between the two or their model working relationship, the composed commanding officer acting as final arbiter for everything his excitable chief assistant prepared. Cho always shouted a smart, Yes, sir, to his commanding officer's instructions, and never contradicted him. And Ushijima, who had never attempted to stop the Imperial Way radicals, knew his zealous right hand, even more than the rest of his staff, shared his devotion to an impossible task, which is largely why he'd chosen him as his chief of staff. Their team excellence promised the worst for Okinawans, Americans and Japanese together. The boys in the Pacific... Dick Whittaker had a week's leave after boot camp, then two months of infantry training, through November 1944 at North Carolina's Camp Lejeune. Shipped to the West Coast on December 1st, the wiry lad was thus almost guaranteed to remain unsung even if he managed to become the hero he still hoped to be. War's meagre proportion of glory to misery was much lower for Americans fighting in the Pacific than in Europe, Location alone ensured them the worst fighting and least recognition. Europe was far more pleasant and closer to home, culturally as well as geographically. Rare Pacific liberties afforded little to take liberty with. Sand and sun weren't much fun when the only change was monsoon-like rain. 
Even rear areas afforded only a tent for home, insect plagues attacking dirty skin and plenty of disease. So much was nastier on the scorching or humid atolls and islands that a law of military life might have decreed the paradox. Worse treatment for those who already had it worse, and more of it, since Pacific fighters' average tours lasted far longer. Actually, a strategic decision made before Pearl Harbor was chiefly responsible for the imbalance. After the heads of the American services secretly agreed with their British counterparts to focus America's primary effort on Europe if and when she entered the war, President Roosevelt's and Prime Minister Churchill's first post-Pearl Harbor meetings confirmed that only the minimum of force necessary for the safeguarding of vital interests. Elsewhere should be diverted from the decisive Atlantic European theatre. The menace of the Third Reich in occupied Europe justified that decision. Given time, her U-boats might cut communications between America and Britain. With more time, her scientists might produce devastating secret weapons, as they did, only slightly too late. But sound as it was, the Germany-first strategy necessitated less support for the boys in the Pacific, who were facing rougher conditions. Those in Europe got more supplies, headlines and applause for fighting their tamer war. Superb as he could be, the German fighting man was an easier enemy than the Japanese, for he fought, the ordinary Wehrmacht soldier, as opposed to members of the SS and other special units, more or less according to the same dictates as the Allied soldier, with more or less the same purpose and limits. With rare exceptions, his goal was to kill others, not to die gloriously. He therefore surrendered when the odds became hopeless. Whole divisions, entire armies of Germans surrendered, but virtually no Japanese. Before Okinawa, only a statistically negligible scattering of Japanese soldiers had been taken prisoner, even after stupefying bombardment, and even when there was no point in fighting on except death, which was the point. They fought to it in the literal sense, often ending with a suicide charge in pursuance of the remotest chance of killing an American before falling. Few veterans of the European theatre could comprehend the implications without personal experience of it. Think not of death as you push through with every ounce of your effort, fulfilling your duties, a pamphlet distributed to all Japanese on active service instructed. Fear not to die for the cause of everlasting justice. Do not stay alive in dishonour. Do not die in a way that will leave a bad name behind you. A year before, when Imperial General Headquarters had decided it could no longer supply its Rabaul garrison, 100,000 Japanese soldiers were left to fight or starve to death. The few captured unconscious, a former Australian war prisoner recently wrote, constantly attempted suicide when revived in an allied hospital, by pulling out IVs, tearing open newly stitched wounds, and even, when their hands were tied, by trying to bite off their tongues. When symbol-conscious General MacArthur ordered the recapture of Corregidor, some 2,000 of its 3,000 Japanese defenders died by blowing themselves up in an underground arsenal. Like his fellows unknowingly bound for Okinawa, Dick Whittaker would have had great trouble crediting Japanese culture's very different attitude toward the last debt. In the West, death was an irreversible end to a brief earthly appearance, a verdict feared because its sentence was unknown. Tears, repentance, sackcloth and ashes naturally followed, whereas Japanese death was much more tolerable. In both the country's major religions, Buddhism and Shintoism, it was more a part of life than its end, and involved much less judgment, let alone final judgment to possible eternal damnation. Actually, boot training gave Marines a better chance than most Americans to grasp Japanese attachment to the community. While Western religion, philosophy and culture nourished a sense of self separate from all others, Japanese upbringing forged far more identity with the group. The cherished goal of why harmony could never be achieved by indulging in individual needs and rarely except through sacrificial pain. Especially in military affairs, Japanese men were prepared to believe that death is lighter than a feather but duty heavier than a mountain. Thousands of years on their cramped home islands had made the almost racially homogeneous Japanese members of one large family in some ways. 
The work patterns of their agricultural society also conditioned them to see themselves as members of a team. Farming, especially of the all-important rice crop, put a premium on cooperation. If a nail sticks out, went one of the most repeated sayings about people who exhibited differences from the norm, hammer it in. Almost all were brought up to feel that conformity to social expectations wasn't an unfortunate compromise, but the only possible way to live. Most Japanese were therefore snug in their own society, extremely uncertain and uncomfortable with outsiders, and habituated from their earliest years to think of what was defined for them as the common good rather than of self-assertion. That was the soil in which Bushido grew. The way of the warrior was originally established as rules of conduct for samurai, retainers who wielded their swords for feudal lords. Elevating courage, valour and loyalty, it corresponded in some ways to the chivalric codes for European knights. Bushido stressed self-discipline, reverence for nature, magnanimity, simplicity, modesty and unquestioned obedience. It was pervaded with gratitude for the blessing of being Japanese.